Okay, so now we have um, Harriet Downing, who's going to talk to us about um, some lessons around rethinking the woodland. Hi everyone, um, I'm Harriet Downey and I'm in the science team. So thank you for inviting me today. It's been really interesting to hear everything so far. Um, but I just want to talk a bit today about what we're doing at the Woodland Trust to create a culture of evidence and some of the successes we've had and some of the challenges. That we've had. So for those of you who don't know, the Woodland Trust is the UK's largest woodland conservation charity. Um, we are landowners, so we have over a thousand sites across the UK, but we also uh, work with lots of other landowners. We have policy teams, campaigns teams, so we work um, in lots of different ways in the conservation sector. There's around 600 staff members at the moment, so we're a fairly large organisation uh, spread across the whole UK. And uh, last year, the trust turned 50 years old. Um, and for around maybe the first sort of 35 to 40 years, I think when people think of the Woodland Trust and still some people today, they very much think of these pictures, just sort of going out and planting trees. And that is a lot of what we still do. And it's a lot of what we've done historically, but certainly over the last decade, there's been um, a big shift in how we work to uh, both be incorporating more science, using more science and evidence in our work, and also contributing to generating. And one of the really big things that we've done in the last few years to contribute to this is releasing the State of UK Woods and Trees report. So this was published in 2021. And this was actually the first ever report that brought together lots of disparate sources of data and information around UK woods and trees. So prior to this report, it was held by dozens of different organisations. It was really hard to get that full picture of what was going on. Um, and once this uh, report was published, it had quite a big impact externally, but also to the trust internally in terms of understanding what was going on and perhaps what we need to do as an organisation going forward. And so it coincided really nicely, actually, with the refresh of our 10 year strategy. And so the report was used as an evidence base to sort of think about what we might want to do as an organisation going forward. And so we have these strategic goals in the organisation, and three of them are protect, restore, create, which might be fairly self-explanatory. But the report helped to sort of prioritise what sort of projects and bits of work we would put underneath these goals um, that we might not have done before. We, we certainly revised some projects and things we did. But perhaps really excitingly, what was added to our goals was enable. So we have really specifically in our strategy a goal around being evidence-led and enabling everyone to contribute to high impact outcomes for nature, climate and people. And when as individuals within the trust, we have to think about what our objectives are every six months, what we're gonna do going forward, we're, to we're told to think about how they relate to our organizational goals. And now we have a goal around being evidence-led as well. So everybody within the trust at some point in the year has to think about how I relate to enable as well as to protect, restore, create. So even if you might not be thinking about it very much in your day-to-day -day job in fundraising or some other capacity, during your objectives at least, you'll you talk to sort of think about it a little bit. And quite excitingly as well, because this report sort of helped us really push forward our strategy and our thinking going forward, this has been turned into a rolling programme of work as well. So the next State of Woods and Trees report will be published in 2025. And again, we'll use this um, not only with individual projects and working with people externally, but to keep on top of what we're doing in our strategy and our business plans. And I think, um, touching on what we've heard a bit before, I think a lesson learned from producing the last report, it was, it was very much led by the science team and not really a whole trust effort. And this time round, to make sure that people want to actually use the report and the information at the end, it's a report that's being created by all the different teams across the organisation. So we did a lot of horizon scanning and discussion with people about what was really important for them to know in their work so that when we produce this, it's really usable to get going. So we have this enable strategy, um, sorry, enable goal within our strategy now, but how do we actually implement this day to day? So we are really lucky to have um, a dedicated conservation team within the trust. Um, and around seven years ago, I think there was only two people within this team. And now there's around 25. So I think that also speaks to how important this has become for the organisation. We're a centrally based team. So that means that we support all areas of the business. So 
A lot of the trust is divided into countries and regions. We support all of them. We support um, all the different teams. Um, and people within the uh, within the conservation team have specific skills and expertise. So it might be in tree health or carbon, landscape ecology, whatever it is that we need. But also um, within our job applications, um, we have to be able to um, oh. be able to conduct evidence syntheses and things like that because that's uh, sort of a core function as well. So, like I said, we work. All across the trust, we work with our delivery teams in estate and outreach. We work with our fundraising teams, communications, our influencing teams, um, to make sure that they have the information they need to do their work effectively. And we sort of split into uh, a few different strands of work. So we have our conservation research and evidence program, and like I said, all of this is still quite new to the trust. It's really the last sort of seven to 10 years, a lot of this has been introduced. Um, so we're still learning as we go, but we have recently, I think about three years ago, started piloting a monitoring evaluation and learning framework using the conservation standards approach. So prior to this, we were still mostly using KPIs to measure what we do. And now we're shifting away from that and shifting away from monitoring for monitoring sake to something that's um, able to help us understand our impact better. And that's being trialed across some of our projects in, in different areas of the trust. And once we've seen how those go, we'll sit down and have a, a look at that and see how we can roll it out across other projects as well. We also have our research program and the research program is where we're contributing using novel applied evidence as well. And we can do this in a number of ways. It could just be simply supplying sites that we have for people to use. We have a lot of internal data, so citizen science programs, uh, data from our estates, but we will have our mail data as well available for people to use. Um, the expertise we have in the trust, not just in the science team, but we and we have a small research grants program as well, where we provide funding to early career researchers to help fill some of the evidence gaps that we found in our work as well. We also now try and influence the direction of research within the sector as well by partnering with uh, universities on uh, big projects. And we're quite lucky that we're actually now fairly in demand from universities. People really want to work with us. Trees are really hot topic at the moment. So we're actually really able to be quite selective on who we work with and say, actually, that project's really nice, but it's not really going to tell us anything as an organisation. Can we add this question in? Uh, move it around in this way, and then we can really influence the direction of research to make it um, applied and useful for uh, other people working in the sector as well. And one of the third uh, strands of work we have is this evidence support function, um, where colleagues are able to sort of submit questions, they want to know the evidence around the specific intervention that they want to implement, they want to create an decision statement of and um, we're able to respond with, yeah, sure, here's the evidence, here's what we know. And if there's no evidence available or we're not really sure, if it's a priority for the trust, we will do um, some sort of evidence a synthesis or review to then help us go in and form what we want. And this is where the uh, State Woods and Trees report falls into this function. And alongside that, we also have outcomes programs. So we have the sort of more technical evidence side, but then we want to be able to translate that into something that's useful for a lot more people. So we have started producing a suite of evidence-based guidance. And so we have a team of people who've gone out and synthesized the peer review literature, the gray literature, but also have been harnessing the decades of knowledge we have within the trust and across the section to produce guidance on things like uh, creation, ancient woodland restoration, these sorts of things. And again, like a few people have touched on previously, we're also thinking about how to increase the capacity to do things better in the sector. So we're turning our guidance also into training programs, training around creation and things. But we're also thinking about how we can provide training on things like critical thinking and evidence currently within our organization. We have a series of internal modules people can take and we're considering putting an evidence as well. And then finally, we have quite a lot of science communication going on internally. We do webinars um, to, communicate, to communicate the research that we're involved in. And we also produce uh, this uh, journal of popular articles sort of uh, explained what's going on as well. So I thought I'd try and give an example of how for one of our sort of uh, three um, 
original strategic goals is supported by evidence. So when we're thinking about how to create woods in an evidence-based manner, what does that mean? What are we trying to do? So firstly, we might think about where do we want to create our woodlands? So historically, the Woodland Trust, like a lot of NGOs, I'm sure, have kind of acquired sites fairly opportunistically. We have over a thousand sites, so we have a lot of them, but a lot of them in the past have been donated to us or we've just sort of acquired them because they're there. We've not necessarily thought it through that strategically. Where can we have the biggest impact? Where can we actually manage something really effectively? So we have a refreshed procurement process for doing that. But we want to dig a bit deeper about um, how we can use evidence to help build us where to have more impact. So we're working with researchers at the University of Kent. Um, to One pro is a project around systematic conservation planning, which is something that's used already in the rest of the world, but not really that widely used in the UK. So we want to trial using this projects and see if it helps us um, better identify where to create woods for multiple objectives. And also thinking about um, where to create woods for uh, human health and well-being. We're working on a project about how equitably distributed across the UK these really rich biodiverse woodlands that are good for people are, and um, if we can use the information to target where to create woodlands where. As already mentioned, thinking about then how we would create woods, we've created this suite of evidence-based guidance documents that helps uh, all of our um, estate managers uh, to follow these, uh, to uh, customise it to their sites. So they have a site assessment handbook, they have their woodland creation guide, and these um, have taught them step by step through the process of how to do this. And again, as I mentioned, we also have now turned this into a training programme to upskill and increase the capacity of people to be able to do this as well. And then finally, when we're thinking about our projects, we also want to uh, try and think about what's been working really well and what didn't work so well. And we want to start thinking about this right from the beginning of projects um, instead of just looking at them at the end. So with our newly procured sites, we're trying to embed research and monitoring from the project start. So this is one of our more recent acquisitions in the background. It's called Snay's Home. It's a bleak barren valley in the Yorkshire Dales. The vision for Snay's home is to have this diverse mosaic of wildlife rich habitats, and that will include doing some native woodland establishment on the site. And so we have embedded long term research into the management plans. We've been really lucky to acquire uh, some funding to support us throughout this. I'm also working with the University of Leeds at York to uh, look at questions around how woodland creation affects things like soil function and ecology hydrology and natural flood management to then help inform our creation projects at other sites. Um, and Snay's Home was also one of the pilot sites for developing our NEL framework as well. So we'll have loads of really nice data from that as we go through. So that was just a kind of brief overview of what we're doing at the press so try and move towards becoming evidence led in what we do. Um, but we do still face lots of challenges and there are still a few sometimes quite simple barriers, sometimes more um, complicated barriers that we face. So I just wanted to point out three of them that we're kind of working on at the moment. Um, one of them is a very simple one, just around accessing scientific publications. So when we go to do our evidence reviews and our syntheses, often we find that we just simply can't access uh, a lot of the papers that we need. One of the ways we get around this at the moment is individuals within the science team have affiliations with universities and we'll just email each other, oh, hey, can you get me this paper, can you get me this paper? But of course, when someone leaves the team, those privileges go. So we're working with some of our academic, academic partners to see if we as a team can get some institutional login and that way we have this permanent access to the papers that we need. The second one is around um, funding. I don't know if this is just the history of the Woodland Trust, or it's just what people like funding, but people love giving us money, planting trees, creating woodlands, buying sites. We probably have more money than we need to do that, but no one really wants to fund us to do research. <laughs> it's a lot harder to sell that stuff that people can't see, even though that's what might have the most impact that might help us to create better woodlands in the long run. So at the moment, we're working really hard with our fundraising team to kind of package up what we do as an evidence and science team and kind of make it more fundable. We're going and talking to donors, going to legacy events and things like that to get people to understand how important funding research is and certainly funding research um, in the long term as well. 
And then finally, also quite another simple one, but that can be quite challenging for us, is colleagues just kind of having to engage with us as a team. Like I said at the start, we're 600 people. We're quite decentralized as an organization because we have Scotland, Wales teams, they're all quite separate. And since COVID, there isn't really a place where lots of people come together and bump into each other. So we have to be really, really proactive in going out and talking to people um, and getting them to understand what we do and how we can help each other in our work. So like I said, we're doing things like webinars, we go out to people's department days, we go to sites, and, and we just try and be really active in talking to and understanding what they need from us and in what format they need it from as well. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. And we do actually have time for questions. <laughs> you should have taken longer if you didn't want any. Um, does anybody have a question for Harriet? Thank you, Harriet. That was great. Um, the sort of three sets of activities, right? You had the monitoring evaluation, thing, the research program, and the evidence support. Would, could you estimate, like, what proportion of your resources of your do you think fall in? That's a question for someone that's not me. <laughs> um, so the way that our team is uh, supported funding ones is through our unrestricted income, so through our members. Uh, and that means we can be quite creative and inventive with what we do, but also if um, you know economic things happen, it hits the science team a lot harder than it hits other areas of the business. So our monitoring, evaluation, and learning framework got uh, five years funding, pilot funding to put in. When we do that revision process, we'll have to go and sort of submit another business case. I'm not sure of funding on that. The evidence support function that's uh, one person full time, and then a few other members of staff part time do that as part of their roles, so that's the salary. And then the research grant program, again, that's one person full time runs that. So when, yeah, we're sort of talking about covering the salaries of, of I think there was a question at the back before you, is that okay? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very, uh, very, speaks very well to me. What I wanted to ask is that we're looking at uh, the impact of using evidence uh, as being more effective, so we can reach more and more cost effective. How, in your experience, how does it impact on innovation? Because is it, will it strengthen innovation because we use a more science-based approach and it will help us to improve? Or would it help, or would it kind of be on a trade-off with innovation? Like the saying, we're looking back more, okay, what are, what's the evidence that we already have? And we only do the things that we are really certain that we have the, the right evidence. Well, some of the innovations will not have, yeah, will not, would have that practice and uh, evidence. Certainly, with interest, I wouldn't say it stifles innovation in any sort of way. I think we often find that there's enough stuff we don't know to try and go out and be creative finding things. And we are lucky to work with a lot of university partners as well. And they're sort of innovating new things as well. Um, but that's it's and within the organization, we've never found it to be an issue if we want to try something new. It often, as long as we do that sort of planning from the start and building it into the management plan, we often very things, especially at some of our sort of bigger flagship sites that we use. We try and do that as standard, trialing new things. Sorry, we are going to have to move on now. Um, thank you again, Harriet. Please do catch Harriet in the break.